Good morning. How are you today? Very good. My name is Matthew Eugene, and I am the chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee. Today, our commission will be hearing testimony on the issue of discrimination against Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Jewish, and Sikh, or if you want, uh, Massa uh, DS uh, communities. As one of the most uh, diverse cities in the country, New York City prides itself on celebrating its diversity and pursuing an agenda of inclusivity. However, since the election of this administration in 2016, fear mongering and racist attitudes at the federal level have had devastating effect in New York. Across the city, hate crimes, discrimination and bias-based attack have all increased and members of Massa JS communities are being especially targeted. Prejudicial attitude against uh, various groups have always been uh, prevalent in America and black people, Latinx, LGBTQI individual continue to be victim of bias and hate crime in high numbers. The focus today on discrimination against Massa JS communities is no way diminish the experience of other vulnerable groups and, are, and rather is present an opportunity to explore some of uh, the different uh, dimension that fuel discrimination against this group in New York City. For example, since the September 11 terrorist attack in 20, 2001, Political rhetoric has often conflict Islam with terrorism, fueling suspicion of Muslim people. These stereotypical views have had a lasting effect on the country's attitude and approach toward the Muslim population and perpetuated the discrimination they experience. For instance, a survey conducted by Pew Research Center in 2016 showed that nearly half of all respondents believe that at least some Muslim in the country were anti-American. Anti Anti-Semitic uh, incidents have also dramatically increased across New York since the 2016 presidential election. According to a report by our Anti-Defamation League, Anti-Semitic incidents in New York City increased by 90% in 2017 compared to 2016. Harassment based on one race, ethnicity, or religion has increased across the country since the 2016 election, and New York City has sadly not been an exception. In addition to the increase of in bias, attack, and harassment, there have been a number of, of high-profile incidents that illustrate the type of assaults that Massa JS have been experiencing. For example, in Crown Heights, there were two separate incidents within a week of each other, where Jewish men were violently attacked while the assailant yelled, anti-Semitic comment. In Beridge, a NPD officer, NYPD officer, who wear high job, was verbally assaulted by a man who called her Isis and threatened to slit her throat. A similar incident was experienced by an MTA worker who was also wearing a high job when she was followed up a train pushed on the stairs and called a terrorist. The surge in bias attack against Mazaje S community and the backdrop of xenophobic rhetoric and policies pursued by this administration prompted the Commission on Human Rights to conduct a survey to examine the first-hand 
account of discrimination that, that these uh, populations were experiencing. The key findings detailed in the final report indicate that for members of Massa JS community in New York City, discrimination and bias attack are a common experience. And we look forward to hearing today from the Commission about these findings. We also look forward to hearing testimony today from members of representative and representative from these affected communities, as well as advocate and other stakeholders to learn more about their recommendation on how we can tackle this targeted discrimination. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the members of this committee who have joined us. Uh, we have Council Member Joan and also Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you very much. And we have been joined uh, also by Council Member uh, uh, Dennis Rodriguez. I, I would like also to thank uh, the committee staff, Abani, Abani Ayuja, Councilor to the committee, Leah Squidpeck, Policy Analyst, and Yariv Shavit, Financial Analyst, as well as my staff, uh, David Suarez, Yunshi Desir, and Adam Yulen. Now, before we start, I would like to ask uh, the Council of the Committee to administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. yes. Thank you. Please state your names for the record. Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental Affairs and Policy at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Edwin Tablada, Advisor for Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs, Commission on Human Rights. Good morning, Chair Eugene and Council Members for the Committee on Civil and Human Rights and Committee Council and Committee Staff. I am Dana, oh, excuse me. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to thank you for coming to testify on this very important topic. And to all of you here, so thank you for your presence. Thank you for your participation. To this is a very, very important hearing. Thank you. You may start now, please. Thank you. Um, I am Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental Affairs and Policy at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Thank you for convening today's hearing on discrimination faced by Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Jewish, and Sikh, or Masa JS, New Yorkers, a topic of great and focused concern at the Commission. As you may be aware, the Commission undertook a survey of these communities in the fall of 2017 and published a report earlier this year announcing the findings of the survey. I have provided the committee with copies of the report in the fact sheet, um, which are also available on our website. I'm pleased to share with you today how the survey was developed and implemented and provide a summary of the survey results and next steps. I will also highlight the Commission's outreach and enforcement efforts as it relates to these communities. I'm incredibly proud to be joined today by several key members of the Commission staff who were integral in the development of the survey and engaging with communities across New York City to ensure the survey reached as many people as possible. Here with me today is Edwin Tablada, Advisor for Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs, and also here from the Commission is Widad Hassan, Lead Advisor um, for Masa Communities, Beth Miller, Liaison to Jewish Communities, Joe Kaur, Chief EEO Officer and Policy Council, who leads our outreach to Sikh communities, and Christelle Onwu, Lead Advisor on African Communities. After the 2016 presidential election in late 2016 and early 2017, the Commission convened a series of roundtable conversations with community leaders and organizations, including immigrants' rights advocates, workers' rights groups, LGBTQ advocates, faith leaders, and racial justice advocates. As we witnessed the rise of hateful rhetoric on the federal level, we observed an increase in bias incidents nationally and in New York City, and organizations reported increases in calls and complaints. The Commission determined that an affirmative survey of Masa JS communities in New York City was needed to better understand what was happening on the ground. While the Commission recognizes that many marginalized groups in New York City are vulnerable to harassment, discrimination, and acts of hate, 
the Masa JS groups were selected because the commission had identified as a direct result of these roundtable discussions that these groups had been experiencing heightened risk of these types of incidents. The research project was animated by anti-Muslim rhetoric and policies at the national level, including overt racism against Arab and South Asian communities. Anti-Semitic vandalism and reports of harassment and bullying that emerged early in the project led to the inclusion of Jewish communities. And during the community engagement process, Sikh community leaders advocated for their inclusion as a group separate from those already identified, given their distinct visible identity and vulnerability to discrimination and hate. As the agency charged with enforcing the city's anti-discrimination and anti-harassment protections and mandated by statute to issue reports, hold hearings, and convene discussions and dialogue to facilitate positive intergroup relations, the committee is well positioned to work with community, sorry, the commission is well positioned to work with community groups to develop a survey that capture diverse groups' experiences with discrimination and bias incidents. In fact, the commission had previously undertaken a survey of Muslim New Yorkers in the aftermath of 9-11 and issued a report in 2003, reporting that over two-thirds of survey respondents experienced one or more incidents of bias and or discrimination in the aftermath of 9-11. The commission felt that it was necessary to revisit this work and expand upon it given the current political climate. The survey was designed and implemented following 15 focus groups coordinated in collaboration with a dozen community-based organizations. The commission partnered with Strength in Numbers Consulting Group a small MWBE certified social justice research and evaluation firm in New York City that specializes in working with the most marginalized groups to do participatory research, pro research projects driven by community needs and accountability to those most affected by the work. The commission partnered with over 150 community groups, faith leaders, city agencies, and elected officials to disseminate the survey and reach community members. The survey was conducted in nine languages, English, French, Bengali, Punjabi, Arabic, Russian, Hindi, Urdu, and Yiddish, over a three-month period, October to December 2017, in all five boroughs. The survey was made available to participants in print and online, including in a mobile-friendly format. Commission staff were stationed at houses of worship, community centers, colleges, legal services providers, and other partner organizations with iPads and hard copy surveys in multiple languages to assist community members in completing the survey. Over 3,100 qualified respondents took the survey. The majority were Muslim, nearly one third were Jewish, with, one, with over one in four being South Asian American and about 14.5% being Arab American. About one in 10 were sick. The key findings showed that high levels of bias, harassment, discrimination, and physical assaults were experienced by Masa JS communities leading up to and following the 2016 presidential election. The report also revealed that victims of such acts are reporting them at low rates. The key findings from the report are highlighted in a one-pager fact sheet that we have, um, and we also have it in the uh, nine survey languages as well. I will read the, the key findings into the record. Nearly two in five survey respondents reported experiencing verbal harassment, one in 10 reported being a victim of physical assault, and nearly one in six said they experienced some form of racial, religious, or ethnic discrimination related problem in their employment in either a current job or while seeking a job. One in four Muslim Arab women who wear a hijab reported being intentionally pushed or shoved on a subway platform. Sick New Yorkers under the age of 35 have nearly twice the chance of experiencing verbal harassment than other survey respondents. 80% of Jewish survey respondents said they were very or somewhat negatively impacted by anti-Semitic vandalism or property damage. One in five South Asian survey respondents said they experienced employment discrimination. Overall, nearly 71% of survey respondents said they did not report bias incidents to a community-based organization, a faith-based organization, the commission, or the NYPD, citing concerns their reports would not be taken seriously, fear of retaliation, and because previous reporting did not result in action. And in addition, which this, this statistic is not on the, the key fact sheet, but it is in our report, Muslim and Sikh respondents were more likely to be told not to wear religious clothing in the workplace, and Muslim respondents were most likely to indicate that they had been prevented from observing their religion at work. In May or June 2018, the commission released the report with fact sheets summarizing these key findings in the nine survey languages. The commission also launched a social media campaign promoting the report and how to reach the commission to file a complaint. The campaign garnered three million impressions or views generated across all platforms and 14,000 visits to the survey project landing page on the commission website. Over 500 reports and fact sheets 
excuse me, have been downloaded and distributed. Consistent with the experiences reflected in the report, the Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau fielded nearly 1,000 inquiries alleging discrimination based on immigration status, national origin, race, and religion in fiscal year 2018, and filed nearly 400 complaints of discrimination under the same protected categories. In 2017, the Commission relaunched its multilingual bias response team, a Commission initiative that originated in the early 1990s in response to wide, widely reported increases in bias incidents, discrimination, and acts of hate. In fiscal year 2018, the Commission significantly expanded this work by hiring two dedicated human rights specialists to serve as bias response investigators. The Commission's bias response team now quickly mobilizes in the immediate aftermath of incidents of bias or hate with a range of different responses, including ensuring that Commission staff are visible and present at the site of the incident with material about people's rights as well as services the Commission provides, connecting with community leaders and affected parties, providing programming and on-site legal intake, and engaging with the community about an appropriate agency response. In fiscal year 2018, the bias response team responded to 146 bias incidents, a greater than 200% increase compared to the previous fiscal year. The Commission both strategically responds to and tracks these incidents, and this tracking effort will enhance its responses in the future. A few examples of the bias response team's work include in, in August 2017, a condominium in Sunnyside, Queens was, vandaliz was vandalized with Nazi signs and other hateful symbols in, the, in its lobby. The Commission mobilized a day of action and a press conference with Council Member Jimmy Van Bremer and other city agencies, and that um, action led to a law enforcement action on, on behalf of our law enforcement team that resulted in a resolution um, earlier this year. In September 2017, a home in Riverdale was vandalized with a swastika on its doorway. It was quickly discovered that the perpetrator was a local teenager, and the Commission alerted uh, the Bronx Community Board 8. The Commission made a presentation to the Board's Youth Committee about the civil rights law and protections under the law. In, 20, in January 2018, um, in, in downtown Brooklyn, a group of young women attacked a Muslim woman, calling her a terrorist and spitting on her. Members of the Commission met with the victim to inform her of her options to file a complaint with the Commission. The Commission also organized a day of visibility near the site of the in where the incident occurred, shared materials on protections for Muslims and those perceived as Muslim. In March 2018, racist, anti-black pictures were distributed on social media at a local college campus. The Commission conducted outreach to the victims, elected officials, community leaders, and campus officers, and distributed literature in the community. The Commission continues to increase its focused community outreach to observant religious communities and seeks to ensure a consistent Commission presence at community-based resource fairs, forums, and events to share information about what the Commission does and what to expect if community members report experiences with discrimination and harassment. For example, in response to the rise in anti-Muslim rhetoric leading to the 2016 election and later the announcement of the Trump administration's travel bans primarily targeting Muslim-majority countries, the Commission partnered with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs on providing outreach and education about the most updated developments, New Yorkers' rights, and relevant city resources. More precisely, the two agencies cross-trained frontline staff to ensure that the agencies were educated on both immigration issues and anti-discrimination to better address inquiries related to the policies announced. Moya created public-facing materials to inform New Yorkers about the latest travel ban developments and how to connect to free legal help and other resources, and the Commission developed materials in multiple languages regarding religious discrimination and harassment protections. Together with Moya and Faith and Community Groups, the Commission partnered in major participated in major outreach events in communities highlighting information about the travel bans and protections for vulnerable communities. The Commission convenes events intended to lift up the experiences of New Yorkers of diverse faiths and bring communities together, while also educating community members on their rights and city resources and provides Know Your Rights workshops for diverse communities. For example, over the last three years, the Commission, Moya, and the Mayor's Community Affairs Unit have hosted the city's iftar in the city, the largest outdoor iftar in New York City, to celebrate and support the city's diverse Muslim communities. In the past three years, it's been held in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. This year's iftar, which was held in the heart of Jackson Heights, Queens, was, in, was attended by more than 600 people and centered on celebrating the resiliency of immigrant communities. This spring, the Commission co-hosted an interfaith Seder for immigrant and, re and refugee rights with the Center for Faith and Community Partnerships, which brought together attendees from diverse, diverse faiths and ethnicities to share in the retelling of the Jewish story of Passover and its liberation narrative and discuss what people throughout the city can do to support and protect immigrant and refugee communities in New York. It welcomed 
130 attendees across many faiths. The Commission partnered on an interfaith Diwali celebration with the Bronx's diverse South Asian and Indo-Caribbean communities, which was attended by over 300 people and co-hosted by the Vishnu Man Mandir, a local Hindu temple in which faith and community leaders from Hindu, Sikh, Jain, and Buddhist communities who came together to celebrate a message of peace and unity. And the Commission coordinated the city's first ever Vasaki celebration sponsored, um, sponsored by, local, by city agencies to celebrate and bring awareness to the city's sick communities. The Commission regularly deploys mobile legal clinics in which lawyers from the Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau meet with community members where they are most comfortable in their communities, at community-based organizations, or at houses of worship to assess potential cases and collect information at the initial stage of a case. The following cases are examples of law enforcement's work in this, law enforcement bureau's work in this area. The commission required a bank to pay nearly $40,000 in damages and penalties after the bank denied a Muslim employee an accommodation to observe her religion. The commission required a Dunkin' Donuts <coughs> to pay an employee $7,000 and attend a training on the civil rights, uh, on, the, on the city human rights law after a manager used a derogatory term in reference to an employee's national origin. That employee is, is Egyptian. The commission also launched an investigation into a vendor at JFK Airport after, after they openly disparaged Muslim employees on an intercom and denied them accommodations to pray during Ramadan. As a direct follow-up to the report, the Commission is, is now partnering with seven community-based organizations to pilot the Commission Referral Network, in which staff from the partner organizations will be trained on how to identify potential violations of the city human rights law and refer cases directly to the Commission. The Commission has developed a referral network toolkit and is hosting its first referral network meeting this month. As re recommended in the report, the Commission is in the process of training city and mayoral staff on the city human rights law and the survey results so that they be are better equipped to identify potential violations of the law and refer cases directly to the Commission. To date, we have provided our Human Rights Law 101 training to the Mayor's Community Affairs Unit, the city's mental health first aid workers, and plan to offer it along with our workshop on understanding Muslim experiences and combating, combating anti-Muslim bias to other mayoral staff and outreach staff at other city agencies. The Commission is also exploring ways to expand education around Jewish and Sikh awareness and the religious discrimination faced by these communities. Thank you for convening this hearing today on this important topic. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It seems that you have re given the response to many of my questions already. Wow. Thank you. We have been joined also by Councilmember Carlos. Thank you very much for being here, Councilmember. Thank you very much. Uh, you have indicated that there, there have been an increase in number of harassment and bias claim in New York City. Uh, you mentioned also that uh, there was an impact of the behavior of this administration. And uh, what you believe, do you believe that there may be other reasons or other causes why bias and discrimination have been increased in New York City against certain population? I cer we certainly feel that the um, dynamic and the, the hateful speech, rhetoric, and policies that have been coming um, out of our federal government and this current administration have emboldened um, individuals to um, engage in these kinds of acts of hate. We're seeing it across the country. We're s uh, New York City is not immune to this. Um, and so we think that that ha certainly has something to do with it. We also wanted to um, affirmatively survey and speak with community members to hear what their day-to-day -day experiences were. So while um, we believe there to be a likely increase in these kinds of incidents um, over the past couple of years because of the, um, the again, the, the xenophobic, the Islamophobic, and the anti-Semitic policies um, and and speech coming from the federal government, we also didn't have a clear picture of, of what was going on in the city even prior to that or um, outside of that context. So it was an effort um, to 
understand and catalog what was happening on the ground in these communities, um, get a bit of a snapshot of their experiences. But what we don't have is sort of an immediate um, comparison to maybe the years prior um, to the 2016 election. Um, what we do have is this snapshot of experiences. And what, as I mentioned in, in the testimony, our reports are up at the commission, um, up in these categories, but up in other categories as well. And so we can't attribute it directly to, um, you know, the the national um, environment. But we we do know that reporting is up. It could be because the commission's presence is um, is 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 more. Um, resonant in certain communities um, and that the commission has additional resources to do more community outreach. Um, so we're, we're sort of uh, theorizing why complaints are up um, and inquiries are up at the commission. As uh, we know that, that there are many other groups in New York City or in the United States that are facing the same type of discrimination, harassment, why the commission, you know, focuses uh, only to Muslim, Arabs, South Asian, Jewish, just, you know, specific groups. Um, Commissioner Malalas uh, joined the agency in uh, almost four years ago now, in early 2015, and her mission was really to make the commission a resource to communities that had been marginalized, had little to no um, relationship with the commission or with government in general. And so um, these communities were part of that, um, of that effort. Um, and we understood through, uh, again, through the community consultations that we engaged with after the election in late 2016 and early 20, 2017, that these, um, that through the feedback we received, um, that these communities were particularly targeted, um, again, with, with, with policies, and rhetoric and increases in bias. Um, so we believe that this was a first, a good first um, step that we would take in um, reinvigorating the commission's role in um, surveys and reporting. Um, it's one of our functions. It hadn't been done in a long time. We are also exploring ways to document the experiences of other marginalized New Yorkers, um, and we. Um, are exploring ways to do it for different communities and different ways um, for different communities so that we can reach um, New Yorkers and lift up their experiences across, um, across the five boroughs and with respect to you know, the diversity of, of New York City. Um, so this was one first step um, with this, this survey and this report and the recommendations out of the report, but we do recognize that there are many groups under attack um, that this is, is, again, one initial effort and that we are um, continuing to, um, to think about creative ways that we can connect and lift up the voices of different communities in the city. Uh, no. The report of the commission focuses on uh, harassment and discrimination in public places. As uh, the commission explored to extend, you know, the, the study of the survey in other places, places like school, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, city agencies. Mm -hmm. um, the commission, so through the community consultation process and through the 15 focus groups um, that, we, um, that we worked with to develop the survey, experiences with city agencies and with other places of public accommodation did come up, and questions about uh, those experiences were included in the survey, and we are in the process now of um, of evaluating those responses and working with our sister agencies on appropriate responses to those questions. Based on your testimony, it seems that the commission is trying to do a lot of uh, 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 things to address or to tackle these issues, issue of discrimination, harassment. But uh, what you believe, uh, do you believe that the commission has encountered certain challenges in trying to tackle those issues. What are the most important, the most uh, uh, important uh, challenges or uh, barriers that the Commission faces sure. in trying to address those issues? So I think there's um, an inherent distrust um, in, in government, broadly speaking, that sometimes the Commission has to overcome. Um, so that's been a challenge and something that we recognize and address as best as we can. One way that we do that is by um, bringing on incredible staff who have 
uh, real true credibility in uh, communities across the city. I have several of my um, amazing colleagues with me here today who all have come from community-based organizations um, who have done, who have deep connections to the communities that we serve. So working to build credi the credibility of the agency as a government agency here to protect New Yorkers and engage with New Yorkers, um, that's always a challenge and we continue to um, attempt to raise the profile of the agency and ensure that people trust us, that they know us, um, and that they um, come to us and see us as a, as a true resource and partner. We know that uh, in New York City is, I say that all the time, and we all know that, <coughs> New York City is home to so many immigrant people. And most of the time, immigrant people, they don't want to report or to go to, uh, to explain the difficulties, challenges, and, and harassment that they are facing because they are fair, you know, to, uh, to face retaliation. And uh, do you believe that uh, there are many other people who have been experiencing those type of harassment or discrimination. Do you believe that you know, there, some of them didn't come to, to raise those uh, issues to the commission? And what are the reasons why you believe that uh, you know, they won't do it or they didn't do it? Sure, I, you know, I can only, um, again, make some assumptions, but many of them are, you know, uh, I think there's a, there's a few reasons why people don't report. Um, I think one is they don't know where to report, and that's part of our mission is to, again, raise the profile of the agency, ensure that we are um, accessible. We, our staff now speak over 35 languages across our staff. We have a multilingual um, info line um, to take calls um, during business hours, Monday through Friday, and a, a system, a mechanism for reporting on our website. Um, I think there is, um, fear in coming forward, and that's understandable if someone is undocumented or if they've had um, not positive interactions with, with government before, they may not want to, to report. I also, we recognize that our system is administrative. There's, it, there's a bureaucratic process, and that is also time consuming to some degree and intimidating to some, to some people. And so we work incredibly hard to demystify whatever process they have to go through at the commission to make it um, less onerous on the individual coming forward. Um, people are busy, they have commitments and family and work, and so we want to, we, we work to ensure that we meet people where they are. Um, we're out in the community doing legal intake as opposed to requiring people come to our office. Um, but there are those sort of structural challenges um, that exist in reporting to the commission. Uh, in your testimony, you indicated that uh, the behavior of this administration may have played a very important role in the increase of harassment and discrimination against Muslim and Arab. But do you believe that, that there may be other reason or other element that may have played a role in the increase of those incidents? I, I cannot um, ascribe the increase to, to any, anything in particular. We are really um, sort of uh, what we're seeing at the local level is consistent with what we're seeing at the national level, and many experts have come to the conclusion that it is likely tied to the increased, um, to, the, to the presidential election, the language and the rhetoric that was used during the presidential election and through the, the Trump administration's policies. Um, so that is the connection that, that we are also making, but again, I, I would not be able to um, make further assumptions as to any other reasons why there might be an increase. Um, and again, the survey looked at a specific period of time. We don't really have an exact comparator for maybe two or three years prior to the period that we surveyed to do sort of a direct uh, comparison. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to call uh, Council Member Ben Carlos for some questions. Thank you uh, very much to our chair, Matthew Eugene, for uh, leading on the issue of civil rights for his entire career and now in the city council. Uh, as you may have uh, read about uh, over the weekend on Friday, a, uh, a person who was there to speak hate was invited to speak on the Upper East Side at the uh, Manhattan Republican Club. Uh, there were uh, arrests of people who were there to protest hate speech. 
And following the uh, speech, the person involved, uh, it's reportedly, was waving a samurai sword in our streets. And then shortly following that, uh, there's video of the people who were there ostensibly to listen and participate in that hate speech, uh, assaulting other people in the community who are then protesting <coughs> that hate speech. Uh, what can we do as a city uh, with regards to hate speech? And uh, what can we do to ensure that uh, we don't see the same type of violence that has occurred throughout our country or even has occurred on the Upper East Side? Um, yes, we are. Um, we've been following this um, horrific incident um, as well. Um, the so there's a you know there there is obviously criminal um, criminal uh, investigations. The NYPD I know is investigating this. Um, from the commission's perspective, there is a provision of our law called discriminatory harassment, which is essentially like a civil version of a hate crime. So if an individual is being targeted with hateful speech and violence um, or threats of violence, um, there is also civil liability available to that individual. So for a lot of the incidents that I reported that our bias, um, our bias response team is engaged with, um, those are discriminatory harassment type claims and people should know that they have a civil remedy available to them if they are being targeted. If um, a, an individual wearing a hijab is, um, is harassed or if that hijab is pulled or a turban is pulled um, or if someone um, who is um, you know, walking down the street and slurs are, are yelled at them because they are um, Jewish or because they are Muslim or South Asian. Um, so we, we can address those cases from a civil law enforcement perspective as well, in addition to allowing the criminal process to proceed. Are you currently planning to uh, follow up on any criminal incidents with uh, civil incidents and supporting victims of violence so that if they aren't, it, regardless of what happens on the criminal front, that they're able to be made whole? Yes. Um, so typically um, what will happen is when we do see reports in the media like the incident over the weekend and we understand that it's motivated by uh, discrimination or bias, our bias response team and other folks in our community outreach team will reach out to either the local community board, the house of worship, the council member for the district, and see how we can partner. We also recognize and connect with the victim if the, vi if the victims are interested in speaking with us. However, we also recognize that in some circumstances, our presence is not useful. Um, so we work with community members to understand where we are best utilized, um, whether it's connecting to other city resources, whether it's meeting with the victims directly or meeting with the local um, community-based organization that is leading that community's efforts. Um, we don't kind of just insert ourselves. Um, we ensure that our response is appropriate for the needs of the community affected. Uh, please get whatever materials you can for us to share over social media uh, to myself as well as the council member. I, I represent half a block away. Uh, so uh, we sh I share the Upper East Side with council member Keith Power. So if you can share that, we have a uh, press conference at three o'clock with Speaker Corey Johnson, and then there's a, another one at five o'clock with Controller Scott Stringer. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Carlos. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, let me call uh, Councilmember Rodriguez. I, I think that one thing that this Donald Trump administration has done to all of us is bringing us together. And we know that when Jews were on the attack, when they escaped Hitler, people stand here for the Jews. Same thing is the same pattern when women were on the attack, when the gays and lesbian community were on the attack, when Latinos were on the attack. And no doubt that the Muslim has been the first target of this administration. And I feel that in 2018, New York City has a great opportunity to lead by example of the nation that we would like to build. And I think that we have made important progress. I can say that society, you know, it, those of us that has been born and raised in another country like myself, living here since 1983, but I make one of those 38% of New Yorkers 
that we have been born and raised in other places. And when we travel to this city, we don't only provide cheap labors, but also we can, we have a lot of organizing skills. We come with a lot of professional skills. And I think that one, we live it after 9-11, how Muslim was on the attack. Not because of Donald Trump, but it's because the government that we have in the White House. So discrimination has been happening, not yet because we had Donald Trump as a president. He had escalated the discrimination, but we know that there's a lot more that we gotta do. And it is in our responsibility not to be just watching what is happening. No, yes, on the Donald Trump, he will be done very soon. But the society that we have built, that they don't welcome immigrants as it should. And he doesn't recognize the contribution that all of them make. And sometimes we lose opportunity to come together and celebrate who we are. And when we do our Independence Day, people feel that by putting a folk road dancing and bringing, in this case, the quebradita, bachata, and the music of our country. That's how culture is celebrated instead of celebrating the ethic of hardworking individuals that all of us represent. So one thing, one of my concerns that I have as a city is how much are we doing to really build a society that not only we put the data together, not only we encourage people to report those cases of hate, but what are we doing to integrate every single group, especially those that has been discriminated in government, in the policy sector? Like, still today, we cannot guarantee to our children that we have a city, that the government that we have, that the agency that we have, where the decision making are making represents the Muslim community, the Hindu community, the disadvantaged New Yorkers here. So what are we doing besides putting the data together on report? How are we doing today to be sure that the Muslim, that the Hindus, that the Latinos, those groups who make the majority, the Asian, are the faces in government? Um, so I can, that's a, um, an incredible um, <laughs> mandate. I, um, I can speak to you what the commission does at, uh, at our level. So um, the, this project was really undertaken um, based on and inspired by the community consultations that we held at the commission. Um, we had a series of, I, I think, up to eight um, roundtable conversations um, in the winter of 2016, and this project was born out of that. Um, the second step was to convene 15 focus groups with 100, I think over 115 um, focus group participants of um, representing uh, diverse cross sections of the Masa JS community, including um, you know, women only groups, men only groups, um, older Masa JS members, LGBTQ members of the community um, to again direct where this survey would go. Um, and then again, the, the recommendations were developed in, in consultation with um, a lot of those same community groups to ensure that we're meeting their needs. Um, and um, we, we, we do, I don't think we endeavor to do any project at the commission without consulting with community-based organizations first. Um, and then throughout the process to ensure that we're taking direction from them. We work for them and we take that very seriously. Um, I, I should also mention that we, um, our mandate by statute is to facilitate positive intergroup relations. Um, and so again, our community outreach team um, works to create programming and events, um, celebrations, informational events that bring communities together that might not typically engage with one another. One, one example of that is we, um, we've hosted an LGBTQ iftar. Um, I think the second one was this past year. Um, at the um, at the LGBT Community Center, not an event that had previously been held um, at the, at a space like that. Um, we had an interfaith uh, social justice seder um, lifting up the the liberation narrative with respect to immigrant immigrant and refugee rights. 
Um, last week we had our Hispanic Heritage event, um, a huge event in Sunset Park. Um, so we really do um, try to be in community, but also building relationships between communities um, that aren't, might not you know, always engage. We're happy to be that convener if it's useful. Um, and so, um, but we, we, we can always do more. And, um, and we, we would love to partner and work with you to ensure that we um, are reaching the folks that need to hear from us. I just would like to encourage by calling you like to really look at the presence of those groups that we know that have been discriminated and other has been integrated in governments. And talk about leadership. I don't talk about how many men and women, as Dominican that I am, I know Dominican make a larger numbers at NYPD in the lower level. But I also know when it comes to be who are the detective, I know that in each borough, the person who is in charge of the detective bureau is white. So, and we look at the NYPD hierarchy, you don't see diversity there. And I'm for building a city where Anglo, white, Asian, black, and Latino have a same failed representations. In the 1900s, the census of New York City was 96% white, 2% black, Latino, and Asian, and the rest of us, we were not counting. Today's population in New York City in 2018 is completely different. And I think that even though we have made a lot of progress, and I can tell you both of us being former teachers, both of us that we serve in other administration, we know that a lot of people in leadership in this administration, they are progressive by career. Not just progressive because that's a cool thing to say. But I feel that we are have some distance. Or oh, yes, you know, calling ourselves who we are and understanding that when it comes to leadership, look to the DOE who are looking to incorporate the holiday of those groups in our calendar. Why we have to be fighting so hard to incorporate new holiday that represent large percentage of those groups that we know that we need to protect. Who are in the leadership in all those agencies? Yes, look at who comes to testify here. Most of those bodies, they don't represent the diversity of the city that we have today. So I hope that as we, don't have, we are not so lucky to know that we have very often pro, real progressive administration, we cannot count the year and say the, the next three years over and still the faces of people in leadership doesn't reflect the diversity of all of us. So I hope that we should tackle that number and you should look about, we have 10,000 leadership positions in New York City and no, those 10,000 doesn't reflect. the group that have been discriminated, and if we need to have their voices, they have to be included in that position. It's not to have one here and there. It has to have a fair share representation, because that's what's gonna be having people not only to look and count the data, but people that can be able, that they're gonna be doing policy, reflecting the need of those groups that make the majority of the city. That's a recommendation. Thank you very much, Councilmember Idanis. Councilmember John, please. Thank you very much, and um, Assistant or Deputy Commissioner, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for coming in. This report is very interesting. As I'm glimpsing through it, uh, I see a number of things in here that I wanted to ask you about. Also, I just want to start off by saying um, I was very proud to be able to be at the IFTAR in Jackson Heights that you mentioned in your testimony, which was great. Uh, even though it was raining, we still had a good number of people who turned out for it. And also that my office helped participate in the, um, you know, distri distribution of the survey as well. Thank so, you. thank you. So, um, I noticed on, um, in the page that deals with methods, um, asking sensitive questions about identity. Um, in the last paragraph, it says, in cover sheets for focus groups, many respondents declined to answer questions about the sexual orientation. The researchers and advisors that the commission decided to best uh, to test an alternative version of a question about sexual orientation, asking first if respondents identified as heterosexual or straight, something else or preferred not to say. Those who identified as something else were asked follow-up questions. So I'm glad that that was in there. I'm curious if you could tell me um, how many um, or what percentage of folks 
well, chose not to answer it. Let me put it that way. Out of the overall number of respondents to the survey, how many chose not to answer that? I don't think we have the data on who chose not to answer, but we do have, um, I think, some data here around the reported uh, sexual orientation for those who did answer. Yeah, um, I see it in the that, report as but well. But we could find out um, exactly how many chose not to answer. Th those numbers seem to be what I would feel are fairly accurate. 87% um, identified as heterosexual, 4.8% um, was queer, um, bisexual, 3.9%. Uh, gay or homosexual, 3.6, and lesbian, 1.8. That's a little low, though, I think. But um, I'm just curious because sometimes, um, we, even within religions themselves, there's the discrimination. And um, I'm wondering if the fear of answering that uh, was part of the reason why people opted out. And it would be interesting to see the number uh, who chose not to do that part and, and how we can better address that as well. So I would love to get that number from you. Sure, we can look into that for you. And then, oh, and then, and, and by the way, I also was very grateful that the Caribbean Equality Project worked in, in distributing it and did the IFTAR with you in the center. I think I had a representative there. Yes. Um, so in, in the, um, I think it's in the um, recommendations from ongoing commission actions, it says that um, prioritizing continued research efforts at the commission with a particular attention to intersectional experiences and their intrinsic vulnerabilities. And that's kind of what I was getting at before, was that, you know, Muslim and gay, Christian and gay, whatever, um, uh, we see that quite often. But it says here something interesting. The commission would expand the scope of the research projects like this one that explore forms of bigotry and their impact. Such explorations should focus on intersectional experiences such as those of LGBTQ religious or black religious New Yorkers. So can you um, fill me in? Do you have plans for that now to do that? What, what is your view of that? How do you see the, that, the, that intersectionality playing into the, the, the work that you've done? And, and just what your feelings are in general from what you got from the returns from the LGBT identified um, respondents? Um, so what's, what was interesting about this process is this, um, the report here is or the survey was very uh, quantitative in that you know people were were filling in buttons, um, identifying their you know their experiences, their identities. The focus groups that preceded this report were the narrative. We got a lot of narrative stories, and that was really where we heard a lot about discrimination within communities. We had um, LGBTQ members of of all of the all of the Masa JS uh, communities participate in those focus groups, and so that was really where we we got some of those stories and wanted to include some of those identifying um, questions to learn a little bit more about their unique experiences. Um, so I think it is something that we are very much focused on. Um, we, uh, you know, many of us live at the intersection, um, both, you know, here at the commission and also in the community. And, um, and so I think as we think about subsequent reports, we are very much, you know, um, uh, invested in telling the stories of New Yorkers through this, this you know, public hearings, surveys, reports. Um, I, I think that's something that we'd like to explore, and I think we can get at it perhaps in a more quantitative, qualitative way, where people are able to tell their stories, communities are able to tell their stories. It's, I think, a little bit harder when we're just talking about like numbers and statistics. So that's sort of where we're envisioning some of the future reports to be. So, um, so you, men you mentioned the difference between the focus groups and then those who actually responded on the, uh, to the survey, right? So those who chose to respond, did they actually have sexual orientation questions on the survey, the paper? Was it all done on paper? That's the other question. Was it all done on paper or was it done online? So it was, there were both options. Um, there were a few ways to, to get the survey. So we had a paper version um, in all of the translated languages. We also had it online in all those languages. The paper version was slightly shorter simply because online, once you chose your identity, you were able to get um, questions specific to that identity or that experience. 
with the paper version, you kind of had to page through everything. So in order to avoid it being 100 pages long, we cut it down a little bit on paper. Um, but we did actually get significant um, uh, completion rates for the paper version because some folks are just not as comfortable using it on a screen, which is understandable, or on a phone. Um, so, we, so it was both available in paper and online, and we did ask questions about sexual orientation and gender identity in the survey, um, and we can get back to you, like I said, about who chose not to answer, um, or how, the numbers, rather. Um, we did not collect any identifying information or IP addresses or anything like that. It was completely anonymous and confidential. Um, but the, the focus group experience was a, just a little bit different because it was really observing conversations and engaging in facilitated conversations in small group settings where people were really allowed to kind of um, explain their own experiences, their own identities, and to the degree they were comfortable too, um, depending on the space they were in. Maybe another number to look at, if I may make the suggestion as well, is the number of people who responded uh, on the sexual orientation question on paper versus those who responded online. And I just uh, thinking that maybe, I could be wrong on this, that they might feel more secure answering it online where it could be done more anonymously than they would on paper where somebody might be sitting near them or something like that. And I wonder if there was a statistical difference there. Sure, we can, we can look into that for you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Bedrum. Thank you. Uh, in terms of, I know that you, uh, the commission has tried many steps to, to address or to tackle the issue of discrimination and harassment. But uh, did the commission evaluate those steps, those actions to tackle these issues? Do you believe that all the steps or efforts made by the commission have been successful? And can you explain? Sure, so um, the report identifies sort of two main buckets. One is um, ongoing commission actions, and the second are recommendations for, for, for future action, um, many of which we're already you know, engaging in. Um, we, you know, the, the measurement of success is a little bit hard to quantify. Um, I would say that reporting is up we are consistently now at around 10,000 inquiries per year, which is about double where we were when we arrived at the commission in 2015, 20, early 2015. So we've doubled the number of people who are reaching out to the commission, and we've about doubled um, the number of, of active cases at the commission at any given time. So that's a significant um, increase. Our visibility, I think, in, in communities has increased. Again, I don't have numbers to quantify that, but um, and, I, and I recognize that we will always have a long way to go, but our, we have increased our staff um, thanks to the support of the council and the administration. And again, we've brought on incredible staff who lead community engagement across the five boroughs um, throughout, um, you know, religious um, diversity, uh, gender identity diversity, and all the other ways that we are um, diverse and, and intersectional. Um, and so we have dedicated significant resources to do that work. But I can't really point to, besides the increased reporting and the increased complaints, um, I, have, we have, I can anecdotally say that I think the commission's presence um, and, uh, and the recommended action items are, are working. But again, it's, it's, it, I recognize that that might be hard to quantify. Thank you very much. In your testimony, you mentioned the collaboration or partnership between the commissions and many community groups, elected officials and leaders in the community. That's great, because I do believe that by working together, we will do much more. But can you give us more detail about the collaboration or the partnership of the commission with those different groups and leaders in the community? Sure. So it, it can take different forms. Um, what we've what we've done um, with with several different community groups, we've hosted um, events together where it will be sort of a forum or a know your rights event where we will have stationed people to collect intake at that event so in the language that the community members speak, um, so that pe we are we are meeting them where they are in those at those community based organizations. We've partnered with um, organizations to do bystander training. Um, we recently did that with um, the Arab American Association of New York um, and Councilmember Justin Brandon's office in Bay Ridge. Um, we have um, uh, 
done outreach events together, Days of Visibility. We recently did um, an, a visibility day with the uh, Anti-Violence Project and some other organizations after a, um, a homophobic attack um, in, I believe it was in Williamsburg in Brooklyn. Um, we, so we've done, we do sort of a whole host of things. We also collaborate on larger events with different community-based organizations. Um, so we engage with youth and organizations that work with youth. We do roundtable conversations about discrimination on a whole host of topics with young people as well. So we have um, different ways that we engage. We bring, as I mentioned, we bring community leaders into the commission for roundtable conversations um, with, with the commissioner present. Um, so, and we will meet with anyone. If anyone wants to meet with us or wants a workshop for their staff, we will provide it. Very good. We all know that, you know, when we walk, we got to take a moment uh, to evaluate, you know, what we are doing. If what we are doing is good or is there anything that we can do to implement what we are doing? As I said, uh, this is wonderful to walk and to partner with uh, different community groups, with leaders, but has the commission done any follow-up after the survey, after the, you know, uh, the, you published the survey? Has there been any follow-up with those groups to analyze and to have the feedback from those organizations in terms of the different steps that have been taken by the commission to tackle those issues? Has the commission has done any follow-up to have their thoughts and the recommendation, and what else can the commission do to make sure that you know you render a better service, you tackle those issues uh, properly or more efficiently. Um. Yes, so one of our key recommendations which we're implementing right now is what we're calling the referral network, which will involve a group of community-based organizations that have really been a part of the survey process from the beginning um, to serve as um, sort of a referral pipeline between the commission and the community. Um, and we're convening that group. I believe our first meeting is next week. Um, they will also be a feedback mechanism for us. They will, you know, we are hoping that they will be open and honest and transparent about how we can do better to serve their communities and provide sort of on the ground information to inform our work. So we're hoping for them to serve as a, as a feedback um, mechanism for us as well, in addition to being able to refer cases directly to us. We have been joined also by Councilmember Perkins. Thank you very much, Councilmember, for being here. Thank you. You know that we are all partners, the city, community group organization, community leaders, the commission. We are all in the same team. What uh, recommendation can you give to the city council and also to this committee and other for us to contribute to, you know, to the success of the commission and trying to tackle those issues. We see um, the committee and the council members to be integral partners in this work. Um, you know, the, the district offices for many of the council members are uh, community centers. Um, and so we are happy to hold office hours in district offices, um, co-host events together in the district, walk along business corridors sharing information um, to local businesses about both their responsibilities under the law but also their protections um, as you know uh, New Yorkers of, of varying backgrounds um, so we really you know we have five borough based offices one in each borough but we are not on the ground in every district um, we just don't have the offices and the, and the people power so we really would love to work with 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 any council member that that is willing to um, spread the word about the work that we do, how to reach us, and also we are happy to, you know, sit in, in district offices and, and, and hold, like I said, office hours or intake hours where we can meet with your constituents and identify, um, you know, if they have claims or, ev or train your staff so that when communi um, community members come to you with these issues, your staff know exactly uh, what we can do to help, who to, how to reach us, who to contact. Um, so I, I think that would be a, a wonderful opportunity for us to partner. Uh, as the uh, commission mapped the location in the city of New York, as the commission mapped the location, certain location, where there have been, you know, more issues or more cases of discrimination or harassment in the city of New York, are there any hot spots? You say, oh, this area 
is a you know very hard area where we have seen more discrimination or more harassment against this group of people. So our report, uh, we we were because of the sort of the numbers we didn't, and we wanted to make sure that people. Um, anonymity was preserved. We did not ask for like borough or um, zip code of residence or incident. But what we do, um, what we do know from um, the work of our bias response team, um, that you know we, as I mentioned in the testimony, um, we responded to 146 incidents of bias um, in the past fiscal year. And um, if I'm looking specifically at anti-religious incidents, that's 76, so about half. Um, and the majority of those were in Brooklyn, that 39 of those incidents were in Brooklyn. Um, and then smaller, and then let's see, the um, majority of the incidents across those 76 were anti-Semitic followed by anti-Muslim. Um, and then I think I could also probably get you some data on borough, um, with borough specificity as the incidents in the report as well. Um, do we have that with us? Um, so it looks like uh, respondents who live in the Bronx were more likely to respond that they had experienced employment discrimination. Um, and um, also in the Bronx, individuals were more likely than residents of other boroughs to experience physical assault. Um, so I could say, um, based on this information, that the Bronx is an area that um, we have some work to do. Um, and um, and I, you know, as I mentioned, Brooklyn also had a high rate of bias incidents in the past fiscal year that we responded to. If somebody makes a complaint to the commission that she or he has been victim of discrimination, harassment, what are the uh, support services that are available for that person? Sure. And what are, if there are also some references you know, to other institutions or organizations in case the commission cannot provide the necessary support that person may need. Sure. Um, so if an individual wants to report to the commission, there's a couple ways to do that. You can uh, fill out a form on our website or call our hotline number, which is 718-722-3131, or call 311 and ask for human rights or say that you've experienced discrimination. Um, there's an intake process. It's about a 5 to 15 minute phone call. We have, we have multilingual intake staff and um, obviously um, we have a language line that we can call in if we don't have staff available in that language um, that will sort of do a general assessment of whether there is potentially a violation of the city human rights law. If we identify that there is a need that we cannot meet because it's potentially, let's say, um, an issue uh, of imminent um, uh, danger for someone, we might refer them to the NYPD, or we have community-based organizations and legal service providers that we regularly refer people to. If it's a question about immigration law, we refer them to um, Moya's Action NYC team or mental health needs go to Thrive. Um, so we have a, a vast referral network within that. Um, if we do identify that this is a violation, potential violation of the city human rights law, the individual can then meet with, an, will be set up with an appointment to meet with one of our attorneys in our law enforcement bureau. Um, and we will then, um, that is a, an in-person meeting or it can happen over the phone as well, um, where a complaint is drafted and, um, and eventually signed and served onto the responding party. Again, if that individual wants to move forward with um, a law enforcement action. If they don't, we still encourage people to come forward, give us the information, because the commission can initiate its own investigation, can file its own case, even if the, um, an individual does not want to put their name on a complaint, which we understand there's reasons why people choose not to do that and very um, understandable reasons. So um, we still want them to, um, to connect with us and provide that information to us so we can collect it and determine if we can um, engage in our <coughs> own investigation. We also um, direct people to and refer people to community-based organizations with which we have strong partnerships. Um, if they're looking for legal representation, we can um, send them to, again, legal services providers that provide free representation as well. Uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, every time that I have uh, a situation, I always have to mention my father, because he's my mentor, you know, my friend. And he used to say to all of us, listen guys, there's no perfection in anything. There's no perfection. There's no 100% correct or success. Every time you have to sit down and see, 
Did I do well? Did I do the best that I can do? And he said, before you go to bed, you got to sit down and say, what I have done during the day? And I'm going to be better. I'm, what I'm going to do more tomorrow to improve what I'm doing. I know that the commission has been trying many things, working with uh, partners, with uh, elected officials, community group and leaders. I know you have been trying the best that you can do to tackle these issues, to make sure that it, uh, we can prevent or probably eliminate or decrease the incidence of harassment and discrimination. But my question to you is, what you believe that can be done, or are you planning, are you working also on, on implementing and proving what you are doing right now? Because there is always room for improvement. I know that you have been doing the best that you can do, but do you have a group or task force to sit down together and say, hey guys, what can you do more? What else we can do to make sure that we reach our goal? Or did we reach our goal? So what is your, your plan for the future? What are the action or strategies that the commission is envisioning right now in order to reach the goal or to come closer to the goal? Because I don't know if you believe that uh, the, we have been, I say we, because we are all in this together, not only it is the job of the commission, it is our job also, it is the job of the government, the community leaders, the members of the community to work together in order to have a community or a city free of discrimination, free of bias. So now the question is, what do you have in place to ensure that we do a better job to tackle these issues? Um, I think your recommendation to convene a, a task force, um, you know, to ensure that we are getting the feedback that we need to better uh, to better serve um, New Yorkers and on, on all the issues that we address is is a is a good one and one that we have taken to heart already in the work that we do. Um, we can certainly do more of that. Um, I think one challenge that we face is, as I mentioned, complaints and inquiries are up at the commission, and we um, take our, investig our investigatory power very seriously. So we, when someone comes to us with a complaint about a specific issue, we will look at that respondent across all issues, and that takes time. So we are challenged to be both effective and efficient at the same time um, to ensure that our cases are covering all, to ensure that respondents are complying with the law across all categories, and there is a lot. Um, but also to ensure that individuals are getting um, the are, are moving through our process as quickly and efficiently as we can. So that's going to be a constant push and pull for us, and a challenge that we face in ensuring that people can access us, um, can get justice, um, but also that we can. Um, look deeply and broadly at respondents and make sure as the city we are addressing patterns and practice of um, you know systemic issues and discrimination as well. Um, we also are um, working to engage more um, sort of nimbly with, with the uh, people that come to us. So if someone is, for example, in need of an accommodation in the workplace very immediately, they're pregnant, they have a disability, um, they have a religious observance, and what they're seeking is the right to, um, you know, stay on the job and, and maintain a healthy pregnancy or, or continue to work productively with a disability. We want to be able to respond quickly and be flexible in that response. Um, you know, it's not always going to work for someone to file a complaint and wait 30 days for a respondent to answer and go through the process. So we look creatively and um, flexibly at how we can adjust our process to meet the needs of the people coming forward. Um. You know, fighting against discrimination and bias, this is a big task, a very big one. And it is not easy, because people can be discriminated, harassed for many reasons, in many ways. And some of the people, they don't even know if they have been discriminated or harassed. See what I'm saying? And the, the complexity comes also the fact that New York City or United States, 
you know, is home to so many people with different cultures, different belief. We came from all over the places. So that means this is a very complex situation. You know, the diversity, the complexity. But in order to address these issues, to tackle these issues, we have to have a diverse team also, a diverse group and complex group also to tackle these issues. And I know that uh, no one can know better than the person who is experiencing the situation. No one can know better the need, what the person needs to overcome these difficulties. My question is that in the commission, do we have you know, a, a, a diversity of um, employees? So that means do we have uh, people? I don't, I don't expect that the commission to hire everybody from all ethnic background, impossible. But uh, what is the effort that the commission is doing to make sure that the staff of the commission is inclusive? We have more people in order for the commission to be able to, to be more effective. Because, you know, when we have people from different ethnic background, people who are facing those issues every single day, they can guide us, in, you know, and they can be a great asset for the commission. What is uh, the effort of the commission to hire or to include people from different ethnic background? Um, it is an incredibly, um, it's, it's an incredible priority of our commissioner that the agency reflects the communities that we serve. Um, when when uh, Commissioner Malala started her tenure in 2015, the agency spoke um, across the agency about six languages. The agency now speaks over 35 languages. Um, it is, as she says, very difficult to get a job at the commission if you don't speak another language fluently. And so we have staff who speak the languages of the community members that we surveyed. Um, we have um, individuals across all, um, you know, sexual orientations and gender identities at the agency. Um, you know, we, we really work to ensure that we reflect the diversity of the city and that when um, we are out in community, we are speaking their language, we are um, culturally fluent um, in, 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 the, in the community. And, um, you know, one of the challenges that we face is as a government agency, sometimes there's inherent distrust. And so we've taken that challenge um, head on by, again, hiring incredibly uh, brilliant and hardworking staff from uh, community-based organizations who have deep ties with, uh, again, the diverse communities that we serve um, through those, the work they've done with community-based organizations come from, from coming from those communities themselves. Um, and so uh, we, are, we are quite proud of the team that we've built and the diversity that our team reflects and continue to, you know, as we um, bring on new people, as other people, you know, uh, move on from the commission, that we continue to maintain that as a priority. Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, uh, we know that, uh, and you just said it, the commission is trying to include as many people as possible, people of a different ethnicity or different culture, in order for the commission to better tackle these issues, but we, this is the reality. What I'm going to say, this is the fact. In order to do a better job in New York City, in Europe, in, in Canada, wherever you are, in this society, we need resources. We need resources. Some of the time, to do a better job, you've got to hire people who have experience, people who know what they're doing. Even we have wonderful people who are dedicated to help dedicated to help the government, to help the commission, to help the non-for-profit organization, and to give back to the community, and to contribute to the success that we are making. But those people, they have needs also. So that means in order to do a better the job, we have to have the resources to attract people, not only who are dedicated, who are talented, but people who can be part of the team without any uh, possibility to face the individual <laughs> issues. So what I mean is, uh, do you have, does the commission have enough resources to reach that goal? Or do you believe that additional resources can help the commission 
on the you know task of uh, tackling the harassment and discrimination in New York City. Um, so thanks to the support of the council and the administration, the commission has grown um, over the past several years um, in, in resources and staff. Um, but we do face challenge in keeping up with the increased inquiries and the increased complaints at the commission. Um, we, uh, the law, the, the New York City human rights law has been amended um, many times uh, under our administration, uh, protections have expanded. We interpret the law very broadly and very protectively, and we um, investigate cases, as I said, both deeply and widely. Um, so uh, we look at, when a respondent comes before us, we look at their compliance across all categories, not just the one that was brought to us. We've also expanded our testing program and our commission-initiated work. Um, so uh, it is a you know it is a challenge that we face. We um, are working with the existing resources that we have, and again have grown significantly over the past three years um, to to better meet the needs of, of New York. And I think we none of us were quite prepared for the events on the federal level over the past couple years and sort of the change um, in focus um, that 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 required. Um, so we continue to respond to those needs and as um, you know, the landscape at the federal level continues to shift and, um, and you know, target additional groups, we will continue to respond in kind. Thank you very much to both of you. But before I let you go, I would recommend and ask, you know, the commission to uh, conduct other survey for the other communities who are facing the same type of challenges. And also, and uh, we will be able to do another public hearing to have uh, a better idea on the challenges facing by those people. Thank you very much for the wonderful job that you are doing on behalf of the New Yorkers. And I want to ensure you that we in this community and also in the New York City Council, we want to partner with you to continue to work together with you in order for New York City to be such, to be or to continue to be a, such a wonderful place where people are very happy to live and to raise their children, but a place free of discrimination, harassment, and bias. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank I'm you. sorry. Thank you. Sorry, how do, how do we? The rapport with the Trump administration. So we don't engage with um, the, the Trump administration per se. The, the, we do work um, in collaboration with um, the EEOC, so the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. It's a federal agency that enforces the federal anti-discrimination law, in, specifically in employment. Um, and so we work in, often in partnership with, with them. They have offices in New York City, and they're doing sort of the anti-discrimination work on the ground, enforcing the federal law. So we're in touch with with them, um, we there's um, some dual filing requirements where a case involving a violation of the city human rights law may also violate federal law. So we um, have dual filing requirements in those circumstances, and we also work on a civil rights uh, roundtable with other state and federal agencies that are charged with protecting people in housing, employment, um, and public accommodations. So we're in touch with sort of our local counterparts at the federal and state level. Um, it's important that we remain um, speaking in communication, sharing information, um, but we aren't sort of engaging with. Um, you know, the Trump administration at, at large. It's really those specific agencies that have the same mission um, that we do. So his influence uh, is, not, is not relevant. I would say certainly the, the policies um, and the language and the tone that's coming out of Washington, D.C. is highly relevant to the work that we do, but we are not, our work is not directed by, um, so, the president has no, um, can, can't sort of direct our work on the day to day. We enforce and we try to make this distinction very clear because I, government can, to some folks, and that's understandable, government is government, um, but we really try to make the distinction that we are, we represent, you know, New York City government. Um, we enforce the New York City human rights law, which is far broader and more protective than the federal and even the state counterparts. 
um, and that we um, do not enforce immigration law, we do not ask about immigration status, that we are a welcome we are, we are a welcome place for everyone to come to you and feel safe. Um, so we, we work very hard to make that distinction clear to people that um, you know, our, uh, we do not answer to uh, the Trump administration in that way. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you very much, Council Member Perkins. And thank you so very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Now we are going to call the second panel. Albert Foxken, I hope that I pronounce it properly, from Care, New York. And Rawar Nancy Albilal. I'm sorry if I mispronounce uh, the name. From Support Center, Arab American Family Support Center. Thank you very much. And Giselle Clapper from the Sikh Coalition. Thank you very much to all three of you, and uh, you may start uh, anytime. Make sure you pronounce your name, you state your name for the record. Good morning. My name is Albert Fox Khan, and I serve as the legal director for the New York chapter of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. My oral remarks are an excerpt of the longer written statement submitted for the record. And, and I'm proud to testify today in continued support of our colleagues at the New York Commission on Human Rights and their indispensable work to counter discrimination and harassment. And moreover, I applaud Chair Eugene for calling today's hearing on this vital topic. We see increasing numbers of Muslim New Yorkers encounter hate and discrimination in the classroom, in the workplace, and even on our public streets. Throughout this trying time, the New York City Commission on Human Rights has been a leading supporter of Muslim New Yorkers generally and in our work at CARE New York specifically. They have partnered with organizations for a variety of projects, including the I Am Muslim NYC Solidarity Campaign and their recent religious and ethnic discrimination survey. The reality is stark. According to our data at CARE New York, from 2015 to 2017, we saw a 974% increase in anti-Muslim harassment, discrimination, and hate crimes in New York. And behind each one of these statistics is a heartbreaking story, lives forever changed by hate. New Yorkers who are fired for simply asking for a place to pray during their breaks, who are have to endure abuse and degradation for wearing a beard or covering their head. Children who are bullied and taunted on the playground, but that nearly tenfold increase fails to capture the story of so many who continue to suffer in silence. According to the Commission's June report documenting bias harassment and acts of hate against Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Jewish, and Sikh New Yorkers, 71% of New Yorkers never report discrimination. 71%. So we know our reports are just the tip of the iceberg. This sort of survey is an indispensable tool for advocates, helping us document the landscape of harassment and discrimination, helping show the scale of the problems we face. The Commission's landmark survey also found that nearly one in five Muslim women report being intentionally shoved on subway platforms. Nearly one in 10 are blocked from practicing their faith in the workplace. At the <coughs> Excuse me. This, this report is remarkable not just for its findings, but for its very scale, showcasing the Commission's unique ability to engage in citywide data collection, the sort of data collection we need now more than ever. Without this sort of broad-based survey and these sorts of tools, we'll never hear from the most vulnerable victims of harassment and hate. 
Since President Trump's first Muslim ban, Commission staffers stood side by side with CARE New York and other community advocates to tell Muslim New Yorkers and our, that our city will continue to defend them against bias and discrimination. This June, Commissioner Morales said that our city cannot and will not let fear, xenophobia, or bias against Muslim and other religious communities become the norm. I'm so proud to live in a city that would make such a promise and call on the council to do everything in its power to make sure we live up to those words. The commission's work is only likely to increase in the coming months and years, along with those of the activists who you have here today, the activists who depend on our partners in the city. I look forward to, committing the, to continuing this partnership with the council and the commission to make sure New York continues to lead the country in our proactive response to harassment and discrimination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Next speaker. Good morning. My name is Rawa Nancy. Good morning. I'm the president and CEO of the Arab American Family Support Center. Uh, we are headquartered in Brooklyn. Our footprint, we have locations in every borough of the city and a total of 72 employees that are serving New Yorkers in every borough. Uh, it's, uh, I am honored to be here as we mark this critical moment in amplifying the voices of the marginalized and in fighting to end discrimination against all communities, particularly the Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Jewish, and Sikh populations. Thank you to the New York City Commission on Human Rights for your commitment to uplifting voices, addressing acts of discrimination, and hate and building a peaceful, inclusive city where all people, regardless of background, culture, or religious beliefs can thrive. At the Arab American Family Support Center, we have strengthened immigrant and refugee families since 1994 by promoting well-being, preventing violence, getting families ready to learn, work, and succeed, and amplifying the voices of marginalized populations. We have witnessed a rise in the acts of hate against our community members in the last several years, which has direct impact on their mental and physical well-being particularly on the most vulnerable among us, our children. This past year, many of our program participants contributed to the findings in the New York City Commission on Human Rights Report, and we were happy to be the organization that hosted the release of the report. The report mentions a number of uh, disturbing statistics about the reality of many Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Jewish, and Sikh communities face daily. Some of them you've heard already. I would like to mention them again because they are that important. 40% of those surveyed reported being verbally harassed. 9% had been physically assaulted, and 20% were discriminated at work. One in four women wearing the hijab reported being intentionally shoved on a subway platform. At the Arab American Family Support Center, our trauma-informed staff hear many of these stories firsthand our community members turn to us when their children are afraid to go to school for fear of being bullied, when their hijabs are ripped off, and when they are taunted in the streets. We have held 
the hands and supported those who have had hateful words sprayed, spray painted on their cars and homes and as young men and women are denied job after job because of their names. We have assured them that New York City will come together to fight for the diversity that makes this city rich and vibrant. Today I join in this conversation in honor of all of those brave enough to share these horrible experiences with us and for those who are suffering in silence. We are committed to ending discrimination, xenophobia, othering in all forms of oppression for good. We must prioritize culturally and linguistically competent services that support individuals in the wake of acts of hate, and we must make it clear that these instances will not be tolerated. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and we are committed to serving <coughs> Those that are in need, our doors are open to anyone that is in need of services, and we welcome the opportunity to partner with you and the commission, as well as other service providers. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Giselle Clapper, and I'm a staff attorney with the SICK Coalition. The SICK Coalition is a nonprofit and nonpartisan national community-based civil rights organization. Our goal is to work towards a world where Sikhs and other religious minorities in America are able to practice their faith freely without bias and discrimination. Our team addresses issues of bias and discrimination on a daily basis. As you may be aware, Sikhs wear an external uniform to unify and bind them to the beliefs of the religion and to remind them of their commitment to Sikh teachings at all times. According to the requirements of the Sikh faith, observant Sikhs maintain unshorn hair, including facial hair, and wear turbans. In North America, the majority of those who wear turbans are Sikhs. As a result, recurring media images of alleged terrorists and negative portrayals of men in turbans have created an environment in which Sikhs are regularly singled out for bias, harassment, discrimination, and acts of hate. Their distinct visible identity makes Sikhs vulnerable to discrimination and hate way too often in many different forums, <coughs> including the workplace, schools, and in inc interactions with law enforcement. Sikh children in schools experience threats, name calling, teasing, physical, cyber, and verbal bullying. They are called bin Laden, terrorists, and other derogatory names by fellow students and in some cases by school staff and faculty members. 50% of Sikh children experience bullying. For turban six students, that number climbs up to 67%. Over the 2017-2018 school year, the Sikh Coalition's legal team reviewed almost double the number of school bullying cases than the three previous three, sorry, than the previous three years combined. Sikh New Yorkers who wear turbans are frequently subject to workplace discrimination. As indicated by the New York City Commission on Human Rights report released in June 2018. Muslim and Sikh respondents composed nearly the entire sample of those who had been told to give up wearing their identifiable, identifiable religious clothing in order to keep their job. The survey also found that a Sikh young person under the age of 35 has nearly twice the chance of experiencing verbal harassment compared to the other respondents. It also found that wearing religious clothing elevated the risk of experiencing physical assault. The Sikh Coalition has received information indicating that in the first three months of this year alone, Sikhs were victimized by hate and bias-based incidents on average once per week. Sikhs were told to go back to their country, that they do not belong here, and they were physically assaulted while driving taxis or engaging in everyday activities. These acts of hate took place here in New York City and across the country. We also see discrimination in public accommodations. Survey respondents who wear religious clothing were more likely to have been followed by a security guard than those who did not wear religious clothing. Even among the communities who do wear religious clothing, Sikh respondents reported having someone trying to forcibly remove their religious clothing more frequently than other groups. 
Clearly, this is a group which continues to endure unprecedented levels of discrimination in many different areas which the general public may take for granted. For that reason, we strongly believe that mandated cultural competency and implicit bias, bias training is crucial for schools and employers to include in their annual employee training programs so the perpetrators of these hate incidents recognize the impact of their actions. We also want to bring to the attention of the committee the issue of underreporting, as indicated by the commission's survey among those who have experienced at least one incident of bias, harassment, discrimination, or hate, members of the Sikh community were the least likely to report those incidents. This is why we believe that tracking and monitoring bias incidents against the Sikh community and other religious minorities is crucial. It can be achieved through more town halls, more round tables, listening <coughs> sessions, and other community-focused events. Through these forms of interactive engagement, a more trusting relationship can be built between members of the Sikh community and government agencies, and Sikhs will then be encouraged to voice their concerns. The Commission recognizes these concerns and addressed the first by partnering with community organizations like ours to visit more houses of worship to collect more data. In addition, they hosted the first ever Vaisakhi celebration in April as a way to build deeper relationships with the community. We applaud the Commission's forward-thinking approach to dealing with these types of issue, with the types of issues that the Sikh community struggles with. We know that budgets can be tight. However, we are here today to underscore for this committee the importance of the Commission's continued efforts and resources to be placed with marginalized minority groups like the Sikh community, who rely on this Commission's work and collection of this type of data to proactively deal with discrimination. Continuing to advocate for lo local agencies to categorize and track anti-Sikh bias is the only way to recognize the impact these incidents have on both the Sikh community and the broader community. Only with accurate data will government agencies be able to allocate appropriate resources to combat the problem <coughs> of hate and bias, including cultural competency training for city workers and those who are tasked with investigating these incidents, as well as creating an environment where those who are subject to the crimes feel comfortable reporting what has happened to them. Accurate data and statistics on bias, bigotry, and discriminatory backlash remains critical to the work we do to better combat and prevent hate in New York City and in America. We appreciate your commitment to obtaining this data, and we hope to see that continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're going to see that? No? My name is the C-Score, and I'm also with the Sick Coalition, just here to happy to answer any questions y'all may have. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for your testimony. Uh, anyone uh, from the panel can answer, you know, to my questions. So is there any collaboration between your organizations or any type of partnership between your organization and the commission? Are you working together? Have you been working together? What you have been doing together to address or to tackle the issues of discrimination and harassment that affected the people in New York City? The quick response is yes. Uh, okay. In fact, uh, the commissioner office is convening uh, a network of referral organizations that have pledged to work in partnership with the commissioner as well as each other so that uh, the services can be uh, coordinated, collaborate, uh, for us, all of us to work together, collaborate with one another and address the needs of the uh, populations that are coming to us for help and assistance. Um, Chair Eugene, it, it would be hard to overstate just how closely we work with the Commission. It really impacts every facet of our operations. Our advocacy team will stand side by side with Commission staffers when we hold rallies against the, the Muslim ban and other federal attacks on uh, marginalized communities. Our legal team will pursue cases that are heard by the Commission for when people are fired 
for practicing their faith on their job, our, uh, our staff will refer enforcement matters to enforcement personnel at the commission who will also pursue those cases. We really, it, it's hard to think of a week where we aren't working you know, incredibly closely with one or more members of the team at the commission to, to address the sorts of issues around discrimination, harassment, uh, that have been described here today and you know with the new initiatives that have been described that that role will probably only grow Thank you Likewise the SIG coalition also collaborates with the Commission um, quite a bit um, Especially if there are any six specific cases that the Commission receives But if it falls out of their jurisdiction, then they um, refer that case to us or if we need their assistance with some of the concerns community members might have, we reach out to them just to get clarifications. Um, in addition, like Giselle had mentioned, we did collaborate and host the first ever Visaki program earlier this spring, and we'll also, you know, we're excited to attend the referral meeting that's going to be kicked off next year. I mean, next week. <laughs> Thank you very much. What is uh, your response to the survey? What do you think about the survey? Do you think that everything is included or there is something missing or any other thing you want to see included in the survey that was supposed to be included in the survey? I, no survey is going to be perfect. I, I think we have to take as a starting point that there are significant barriers to reaching uh, the totality of the people impacted by the events that are described. But I, I, when I look back, at the survey, I really am astounded by the participation rate, the numbers of people who are captured in this survey who you know, have not been uh, found in any previous outreach attempts. So I think that really, while, while I can't claim that it is perfect, I can't see any way it could have been systematically improved uh, absent unlimited funding to reach the every single New Yorker impacted by hate. I really think it's a stunning achievement to have reached as many people as the commission did. Okay. I wanna echo that as well. Um, it, it was uh, the purpose of sampling in which uh, the commission's office reached out to, to members of the community, community stakeholders asking us to uh, reach out to community members, assure them that their responses will remain confidential. All that effort was absolutely uh, uh, resulted in as many people as possible participating in this survey. So we are very, very grateful to have been included and for us to have been instrumental in reaching out to our community members to assure them that th their responses will remain confidential. As you could imagine, uh, during this environment, there is tremendous fear as to why are they asking me these questions? What's gonna happen? to my responses, are the responses gonna be linked back to me? Would there be any retaliations, uh, retaliations against me? So I think uh, overall, uh, the commission has done a great job under the current circumstances. Thank you very much. Yeah, I will also echo that. Um, I, you know, I think that, as I was saying earlier during my testimony, we at least in the state community and the experience of hate and bias incidents, we lack accurate data. That's a, it's a real problem. We don't have enough data. We don't have comprehensive statistics. And that kind of report, this is what we need. This is what helps us do the work that we do better and you know, know where the need is and kind of just assess what is actually going on. So we are extremely grateful for the work of the commission. And you know, as Albert said, it can't be perfect, but it's a great first step, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, so uh, we all agree that there is no perfect solution, of course, but it seems that uh, the, the survey has increased awareness and motivated more people 
to be involved in the uh, effort of the commission or in the of effort of the team to tackle the issues of discrimination and uh, harassment. But you indicated also that the cases have been underreported. My question is why, you know, people are not prompt or, no, or didn't report, you know, the 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 the, the, the cases of the of discrimination or harassment they have been facing, and what should be done to ensure that more people come forward to report those cases. I think it's completely unsurprising given this city's history of discriminatory policing, including long-standing surveillance practices that targeted and marginalized the Muslim community and other communities that there are, there's a real trust deficit when pe the city asks people to report. And I think that you know, the survey and the outreach efforts we've seen to broaden you know, the commission's connection to these communities is only enhancing the rate at which people will respond. But you have to understand that especially when, that in this climate, when the President of the United States is trying to instill fear on a daily basis, it is hard to get victims of harassment and discrimination to come forward. It is hard, not just in New York, but across the country, and I think the thing that stands out is not the under-reporting rate, but the number of things that are being done to counter it already, because I work with chapters of care all across the country, and I don't know a single city anywhere in the United States that is taking on this, the sort of intentional, multifaceted, comprehensive campaign that we see here uh, in New York. Okay, thank you very much. I could give you an example. Um, in the instance in which uh, one of our employees, his car was spray painted with hateful words, uh, he called the police and uh, the response was, did you have a fight with your girlfriend? Uh, so he felt uh, he was uh, victimized twice. Uh, this, is, um, this is something that's ongoing. It took the effort of us reaching out to individuals from the police department who are uh, culturally competent, who are from the community, uh, for the incident to be taken more seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think in our work, the issue of underreporting is that's definitely a, a problem, and there are different reasons. I'm sorry about it. <laughs> I forgot to do that. Eh? <laughs> okay. okay. Let me let me let me turn it off. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Um, so I think there's different reasons. There's, uh, you know, as Albert mentioned, there's just this general lack of trust in law enforcement. Unfortunately, there's also what we see in the community is the fact that people sometimes don't, they just don't know what their rights are. And that's something that we work a lot on is, you know, having know your rights presentations for the community to tell them, you know, this is a crime, that's not okay, this is something that you have a right to, to report, and they just don't know because no one ever told them that. And I think something else is the normalization of this type of behavior where, you know, we see kids in school who are bullied and they think, oh, well, it's not a big deal, it happens to me all the time. You know, they don't know that, no, it shouldn't be normalized and it's, it's something that you have to, to report. So, yeah, I think there's different reasons why, and it's definitely something that we work a lot on to try to, you know, have less. Uh, it said in the report that I think this members of the Sikh community were the least likely to report those incidents, so we're definitely trying to change that. And one of the other reasons, for example, if a community member's been experiencing something over a long period of time, but they feel like they've had it and they still might not report it because every time they've raised their concerns in the past, they weren't taken seriously or law enforcement just kind of brushed the issues under the rug. So to kind of mitigate that, 
we start, you know, telling, we start it young, we start them young. We start telling the youth what their rights are when they're at school, the moment they got on the school buses, right? In their cafeteria, in the playground. So that even as they're growing up, as they enter the workforce, they know what their legal rights are and what, you know, is and isn't acceptable in the workplace. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let's talk about a little bit, very briefly, about the services provided to the people who have been facing discrimination or harassment. Could you tell us uh, what type of services that your organization provide to people who came, come to you for assistance when they face discrimination and harassment? And you can mention also some of the things that you know about services provided by the commission or if there is any other services you believe that should be provided that are not provided in order to help those people overcome this very, very ugly and difficult situation? Uh, so I, I work for a statewide organization. We represent clients from the tip of Long Island all the way up to Buffalo and everywhere in between. And I have to say, practicing uh, this sort of law in New York City, it's night and day from the rest of the state. When there is an array of services available when a client of mine is targeted in the five boroughs that simply don't exist in the rest of the state. For example, there was a mediation we conducted before the commission. And the mediation program at the commission is relatively new, just in the last few years. But through that program, prior to any litigation, we were able to get a significant settlement for someone who had been fired fired on their third day of work because of their religion. A and we were able to, do, to get a settlement that was much larger than anything we could have secured elsewhere in the state because of the laws we have in New York, but also because of the commission's uh, mediation services. We've worked with them to flag uh, individuals who we believe are committing uh, harassment or discrimination. For example, we've referred individuals who have uh, alt, an alt-right blogger who boasted about firing taxi drivers because of their perceived religion. We have that enforcement capability doesn't exist to the same extent elsewhere in the state. We have uh, numerous matters that we have either referred to the commission in other capacities or where we have looked at litigation before the commission. The commission, in addition to having broader uh, coverage in terms of the protected classes of individuals who are protected under New York City law, there's also more aggressive enforcement, penalties that are available, testing that is available to actually verify allegations of um, you know, discrimination. And really, as a litigator, it, it is my, the, my preferred venue whenever I have the option. Thank you very much. So our, our services are being offered on multiple fronts. Uh, first, they're being offered at the uh, policy level as well as uh, the training level for other uh, community service providers, as well as uh, law enforcement and judiciary representative. We offer cultural competency trainings, and we are tapped to on a regular basis by other uh, nonprofit organizations and uh, law enforcement, as well as uh, the uh, uh, judiciary. We are at the Family Justice Center. We are in all five boroughs of the Family Justice Center. Uh, so we offer trainings on cultural competency on a regular basis to uh, the service providers that are working in the same arena. Uh, we have staff that speak 15 languages so we are tapped into on a regular basis uh, for the various languages that our staff speak, uh, as well as the various dialects that our staff speak. Uh, the Arabic language, there's classical Arabic, but there is a total of 128 different Arabic dialects that are spoken, and the majority of those dialects are spoken by our staff members. So we're tapped into on a regular basis. 
we have uh, uh, an arm of our organization that's offering legal services. We work with uh, others that are in the arena that are providing legal services to our constituents. Our primary goal under our legal services is to make sure that our constituents are not taken advantage of uh, uh, those attorneys that may take advantage of them or charge them too much money. So we're offering our services, legal services for free. And if there are issues that have to do with uh, discrimination, we direct them to uh, other organizations that can handle such uh, situations, uh, in addition to uh, uh, providing trainings to our constituents about Know Your Rights. We have our youth services, as you could imagine, uh, this is impacting our children and youth in, uh, uh, in a severe ways. Uh, many of our youth, for example, one of them said uh, to me, he feels that uh, in many situations he need not to apply for jobs because of his name. His name is Osama. Uh, another one, he said, that I will have unfulfilled dreams. Uh, to, my dream has always uh, been to become a pilot, and unfortunately, I could never become a pilot because I will always be questioned why am I enrolling in, in school to become a pilot. Uh, we also provide mental health services. As you could imagine, our mental health professionals that are there to provide counseling to individuals that have been discriminated against uh, the trauma will last with them for a long, long time. Unfortunately, uh, we get tapped uh, very, very quickly, and we have a waiting list uh, for um, uh, counseling, to provide counseling to our constituents. So in situations like that, we are working with various hospitals, but again, uh, even the hospitals, they're looking to us for answers, and we're working with many hospitals that are uh, working in the community to provide <coughs> mental health counseling to our constituents. Unfortunately, we don't have um, a, a therapists who are um, trained as culturally competent in individuals. We're working to expand that network of trained professionals. Thank you, thank you very much. The Sick Coalition also provides uh, free legal support to people who have been impacted by crimes rooted in bias. And in addition, we also use those opportunities to then go in and be able to train the police officers investigating the case. Perhaps the prosecutor didn't have all of the resources they need to understand the background and history of where this bias and the crime may have been coming from. Um, one of the, you know, very New York specific examples that we always are, you know, we always engage in is we go in and train the teachers at the Pathways to Graduation programs. Uh, we recently just did two of the trainings this year. And every time they have, you know, even if it's a resource fair for the kids, we are, you know, we're sure that we're present there. So even the children know all of the sick kids at the school know what rights they have, what resources are accessible to them. And anytime there is an opportunity to be present at any of the pre professional uh, development fairs or opportunities, uh, we go in and we train the teachers. Um, as uh, she also mentioned, the SIC Coalition also runs a youth program where it is a youth-led, youth-based program, so the youth are then able to go in and teach their fellow peers about what rights they have, lead the bullying workshops, and do everything so everyone is able to resonate with one another and learn what their rights are in a non-lecture-type like you know, lecture type way. So all of our programs that are external-facing are very engaging. Um, just in late August, right as the school year was about to begin, we release an educator's guide that includes all of the basic information teachers need to know so that when they are teaching about U.S. immigration or uh, world religions, they know exactly what information they need and what, you know, they have all of the resources they need to be able to teach their classes 
Um, and so it's important that all of our agencies, all of our different types of departments have accurate information to then be able to, their, to, to, be able to do their jobs properly. Thank you very much. <clears throat> but I want to thank uh, each one and all of you and commend you for the services that you are providing for uh, our brothers and sisters, because we are all brothers and sisters, regardless of our ethnicities, the countries that we came from, it doesn't matter. We are all human beings. And I think it is our moral responsibility also as human beings to do everything that we can do to better the place where we are all living together. I'm talking about New York City, United States of America. And when human beings are facing challenges, it is tough. Physical challenges are very, very tough. But moral challenges, psychologic challenges, uh, can be more devastating because that can destroy people. And that can have an impact not only in the human being and the person, but in the family also, in, in our society also. So that means by helping those people, what we are doing, we are making our communities better. And I commend you for that. Thank you very much for what you're doing every single day for our brothers and sisters. And uh, we in this community, we are committed to work together with you because we are part of the team. It is our responsibility to make New York City a better place. Thank you very much. Thank Have a wonderful day. For having Thank us. you. Thank you. Oh, Rabbi Cohen uh, left also. Okay, I want to thank Rabbi Eli Cohen anyway. It's uh, from Crown Heights uh, Jewish uh, Community Council. He left for me. Uh, Rama Hisa Joahim, thank you very much. From Arab American Association of New York. Aniga Nerabi, I hope that I pronounce it properly, from Muslim Community Network. All right. Thank you very much, Miss. You may start yes. your statement. Yes, good morning. Um, my name is Rama Issa, and I am the executive director of the Arab American Association of New York. We are a direct service and advocacy organization serving the Arab and Muslim populations in New York City, and we are located in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, to be exact. Um, I just want to say how proud we are to see that the city has invested in studying the rise of hate speech and crime against uh, Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Jewish, and Sikh communities. Uh, as an alumni of the City Commission on Human Rights, I am incredibly proud to see that this report has come to fruition. It wasn't long ago when I worked with the commissioner um, and others at the commission to get this project kicked off the ground. Um, although its findings are not totally surprising to us, it is important for community-based organizations like ours to have numbers that validate the reality that we see every day on the ground. The data is striking, for instance, the 38.7% of survey respondents reported experiencing verbal harassment. We have heard from several of our members' stories firsthand who have been harassed on the streets or in the subways or in schools. We've always operated with the knowledge that community, unfortunately, does not always trust many government agencies. Uh, or law enforcement, and the survey results show the difficulties of those relationships with findings showing that at least 71% of Muslims, Arabs, South Asians, Jews, and Sikh communities in the city uh, do not report discrimination when it happens. Uh, that proves once again that folks in our communities don't trust the system or don't feel like the system takes them seriously. Just last Friday, one of our organizers told us about a family who was being harassed by their landlord because they're Muslim. The landlord has raised their rent three times, 
um, in the last year alone. This isn't an isolated event. We're speaking about two families at least just this month with similar stories, um, similar situations. One of the families, a Syrian family, another one, a Yemeni family. These are the most vulnerable amongst our communities today, given the Muslim ban. And they are the ones who are being targeted. Um, one of the family members of this Yemeni family that I just mentioned actually called the police and uh, after the landlord changed the locks and the police told our member to go get a private investigator, a private bodyguard when she inquired if the police could protect her. These discriminatory actions are putting more pressure and adding to the already existing anxiety and feelings of, of hopelessness and isolation amongst our communities. The report also shows that one in four Muslim women who wear the hijab reported being intentionally pushed or shoved off a subway, a subway platform. This finding is chilling. We're talking about New York City. 27% of our hijabi sisters have experienced some form of physical assault and harassment while on the subway. I just want everyone to take a second to let that sink in. Just last summer, one of my own staffers had a bag flung at her face by a white woman on broad daylight in Bay Ridge. We also know that one in six of our people experience some form of discrimination, racial, ethnic, or religious in their place of employment. We hear these stories from clients and members every single day about how folks in our community feel unsafe in their place of employment. Just recently, we saw a young hijabi woman in our community, a single mother, who took off her hijab because she felt like employers were not considering her for jobs because of her headscarf. We're working with the commission to create a community network for those who experience um, any acts of hate. Being able to refer cases to organizations such as ours, uh, who support the Arab and Muslim communities in Brooklyn, to seek resources that address legal and mental health support. Um, we know that over half of those who experience uh, experience being unfairly fired, and over a third of those who experience physical assault screen positive for probable depression. This shows how important it is to have access to mental health services, especially when our communities are constantly living under attack. After the election of 45, the Arab American Association created the Accompany Project where more than 8,000 allies have signed up for trainings across the city to become upstanders. Um, and we hope to continue to work with the New York City Commission on Human Rights in their efforts to train city employees who work directly with the public in order to de-escalate bias incidents. Again, I just want to thank the hardworking people at the New York City Commission on Human Rights and the Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Malalas, uh, who found the need to present this in form of data so more people can understand the severity of what our folks have been experiencing just this last year alone. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank all the advocates, all those organizations who are working together to make New York City a better place for all. And one thing that I want to say, all of us, we have the right to equally benefit from all the assets, the resources that this great country offers to all of us. And all of us, we have the right to receive or to get a piece of the American dream. And also, rights go also with responsibility. We have the moral obligation also, all of us, to work together to ensure that we respect each other to ensure that we participate in the effort together to make New York City or United States a better place. And all of us who will benefit. And that the, another reason why I commend all of you for what you are doing. Because every single day, this is part of our right and our moral responsibility to do everything that we can do as human beings. It doesn't matter where we came from, what is our religion, your faith your, or your or political affiliation, if we work together to help our brothers and sisters who are facing discrimination and harassment, we will make New York City a better place 
and we will give them also the tool that they need to overcome those very tough issues. And guess what? It's going to be a win-win situation. Thank you very much for what you are doing every single day, and thank you for your testimony also. Yeah. And I want to thank also the staff of the city council, those people who make it possible for us to conduct those important hearings. And thank you also to the staff of the committee. Thank you, and may God bless you. Thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. Okay. Thank you so very much. Thank you. My regards to my all my friends, okay?